evening Bible study. We're in the seventh chapter of Acts. We're dealing with Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin after being charged with a crime. His crime had to do with some things that he said to one of the synagogues. And so I've got a uh, kind of an introductory statement here about how Stephen has been seized and brought before the Sanhedrin. And so they have charged him with speaking words of blasphemy against Moses and against God, of constantly speaking against this holy place and the law, of saying that this Jesus of Nazareth will, will, will destroy this holy place and that he will change the customs that Moses handed down to us. And so the defense, and I'm calling it a defense. Uh, some people call it the speech. Uh, I'm saying that Stephen defended Christianity and himself with this speech. And so he addresses the charges before the council. And I call your attention to the three pillars of Judaism which they charged him with violating all three. He talked about the land, he talked about the law, and he talked about the temple. And they said that all of these are God's gift to his people and that Stephen had attacked every one of them. And so he defended himself and when he got down to, and told them some words about the temple, they, uh, they were unanimous, and it says they charged him together and they stoned him to death. And so that's what chapter 7 is about. But I guarantee you that chapter 7 is a whole lot more about, it, it has more in it than I can cover tonight or any other night. And the, uh, the literature about it is voluminous. I thought I would show you this right here, which is not necessarily a, a part of the uh, of the seventh chapter, but we've talked we've been talking about all these people, and so here here are the parties or the groups, and uh, they're not necessarily in the order of importance, but uh, all of them are importance, and uh, and most of them are mentioned in the New Testament in one way or another. Now you may not have recognized how they were mentioned, but they're there. Of course, the Sadducees are the ones that have brought the charges against the apostles that had to do with the, with the uh, conviction against the apostles twice and of being, being uh, whipped. And then the Pharisees are those who have begun to defend the church, because it's talking about someone who'd been resurrected from the dead, and they were looking forward to a Messiah who would be resurrected. So the Pharisees, up until Stephen's speech and words, the Pharisees are beginning to be on the side of the Christian church. I will go on and point out that after this, they were not on the side anymore. This, this speech turned them the other way. And then there's the Essenes or Essens. The Essenes are led by priests who got disgusted with the way the Sadducees were running the temple in Jerusalem. And so they established themselves out in the wilderness. Some say that they're the ones that raised John the Baptist after his elderly parents died. And that's why John the Baptist spoke out in the wilderness and wouldn't wear the clothes that they wore and wouldn't eat the food that they ate and wouldn't come to Jerusalem and wouldn't acknowledge that there's anything good in Jerusalem. Jerusalem went out to John the Baptist. And that has been attributed by a lot of theologians to these Essenes. And then there's the Zealots. And uh, you had one of Jesus' disciples, wasn't that Simon Zelote, as they called him uh, in the New Testament? Simon the Zealot. Well, you're talking about people that thought that the Romans were the curse of God on God's people 
and they would kill one of them whenever they got the chance. One of their favorite things to do was to get in a crowd of people with a dagger and they would uh, come up beside a Roman or a Roman sympathizer and run the dagger under their arm into that person's rib, ribs and then walk away before he fell dead and so forth. That's the zealots. And then you have the apocalypticists. Well, now, who in the world is that? Well, <clears throat> many people inter interpret Revelation as a book that is to be in, uh, read literally. It says this, and it means this, and it, and it means it because it says it. Well, it leaves out that there are these people who, who wrote and who lived in the apocalyptic type mindset. They developed a uh, language among themselves and a, and a code, and there's apocalyptic literature that we possess plenty of, and the nearest thing we have to it in our Bible there's more, uh, there's more uh, of that influence in our Bible than just one book, but the most obvious one is Revelation. And so that's who they were, and, and they influenced that type of a writing that to us is mysterious. And then there's the Hellenists. That's who's bringing the charges against Stephen. And Stephen is a Hellenist himself. And remember that this means that these are Jews that because of the upheavals that have been part of the history of the Jews from the beginning, they've been scattered all over the what, what was the known world at the time. I'll call it the Greco-Roman world. That leaves out what's back east all the way to China and India and so forth, that all existed at the same time and they traded with them. That's, uh, some people say that's where the wise men were from, but the Hellenists were from the diaspora. And these are Jews that would come back to Jerusalem at the temple at the right time. And the importance of their duty to come back to the temple is what has upset the Hellenists against their brother Stephen, because Stephen, I'll, I'll, I'll bring all this out in, as I go through the seventh chapter. And then of course you have the Samaritans, and they accuse the Samaritans of being a mongrel race. Well, who the Samaritans really were, were the more common people of the Jews who when Nebuchadnezzar hauled the people into captivity, he didn't haul everybody, and he didn't haul all kinds. He hauled the elites. I mean, you have Daniel and those young men that were the choice men of the nation. That's, that's what Nebuchadnezzar was after. And, and so the, the leading people of the Jews were taken into captivity with the idea that they're gonna serve the king with their abilities. And all these common people that were uneducated, farmers and sheep herders and so forth, they left them in the land. And so when they came back from the captivity, they were discriminated against and they wound up being called Samaritans. And they're just really the people that never did go off with you guys in the captivity. And if y'all got questions about that, well, please raise your hand, I will respond. Uh, this is not what the lesson's about, but it has to do with the lesson, does it not? And then last, and I'm not sure, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I can, uh, I've looked this up and I'm not sure how to say it, but I'll give it an attempt. It's the uh, Amheheretz. Now, who in the world is that? Well, that is people that are even a lower class of people than the Samaritans. For instance, uh, those for, who were from Galilee, uh, you know that remark about can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, that's that's the kind of thing the, you're talking about. All these people are ranked in importance and class. And, of course, they rank themselves. And, and each one of these classes would not admit that there was anyone better than they were. The Samaritans exist till this day. And if you talk to a Samaritan, he'll tell you really quick that they've got the scriptures that matter and they've got the place to worship that matters, 
and that the Jews lied in the scriptures and changed it to Jerusalem, and that business about the temple is all a bunch of bunk. That, let's start arguing about that now. And the Amha Haaretz, of course, were anybody who hadn't been to school with, say, the Pharisees or the Sadducees or so forth. And so who'd that take in? Well, that took in Jesus Christ. That took in all 12 of the apostles. And we don't know whether it took in Stephen or not. Stephen is not from Jerusalem. He's not, uh, probably not even from Palestine. He is a Hellenist. And the education that he displays uh, sounds like he's from Alexandria where they, where they taught some of the things that, that are said in this speech. And I'll get into that. And I hope I didn't mystify anything. Y'all got any questions about that before I roll on? All right, you may follow this class in the seventh chapter of Acts in your Bible. And uh, I, I assure you that we're not going to romp through it. We're going to go through it very slowly. And so I'll give you this review about the ministry of Stephen. Where he got in trouble was teaching the gospel in the synagogue of the freedmen. Now, that, that name of the freedmen probably indicates that these men were the sons of slaves out there in the Greek Roman Greek world that had been set free and as free Jews they had prospered and now they've got a synagogue in Jerusalem and they can come to Jerusalem and they can worship at the temple and they can be taught in their synagogue and Stephen has gone down there with the gospel and they dispute his words but they cannot stand against his wisdom and so they resorted to persuading men to give false witness against Stephen. And I'm in the sixth chapter now with this, and this is a resume of it. So they seize Stephen, they put hands on him, and they bring charges in the Sanhedrin against him. And so the charges, I've already read them, I'll read them again. He spoke words against Moses and against God. Well, that Moses business has to do with the law. Remember the three pillars, the law. And this business against God. Well, God gave him the land. And when he talks about God and the land, he didn't say it their way. And so they're going to charge him with it. He's constantly speaking against this holy place and the law. Well, one thing that united all the Jews in Jerusalem, do you remember that slide that I put up there with all eight of those? All eight of those groups agreed on one thing with almost fanaticism, and that's the importance of the temple. And they, I mean, even the Sadducees couldn't corrupt it to the point that they would all quit. The Essenes came the closest to abandoning the whole show. Well, they were united about the, the holy place. And so when Stephen talked about what Jesus had said, that the time would come, then it wouldn't even be there. They were offended and they charged him with saying that Jesus was going to destroy the holy place. And so then he talked about that they're going to change the customs Moses had handed down to us. Now that thing right there, I'm going to say, and, I'll, and, and when I say this, I will remind you that of all the things in the New Testament, there are probably more different opinions about this seventh chapter and what it means and what he was trying to say. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I read one theologian that made a remark about it. He said, the literature is voluminous. Well, <laughs> the literature is voluminous and the dispute about the meaning of it and the theology of it is wide and almost every denomination that exists has got a slightly different version of this chapter right here. And so as I wade into this, I'm not going to tell you that this is yours or this church's or the denomination. I'm going to tell you that this is mine the best I know how. And that's about as good as I can do. 
Who, what, could, what else could I do? Stephen addresses the Sanhedrin, and, and one reason for the importance of this thing is that Luke, in giving you the history of the development of the gospel in early times, gave more space in Acts to this speech than any other speech, and there are other speeches. But there is nothing in there to compete with this for space or for controversy, for that matter. He addresses these three subjects, and that, of course, is a matter of scholarly opinion. There are some say that he never did address but one thing, and that's the temple. Well, if you read it really quick, you might agree with that. But I didn't read it very quick. And I recommend that if you want to really get into it, uh, read it more than once. But he addressed the three pillars of Judaism, the land, the law, and the temple. And it's all in there. And then he winds up by saying that they have killed the righteous one who had the law and disobeyed it. They're accusing him of tearing down the law. And he said, y'all are the ones that have torn it down. And not only that, but Moses predicted a Messiah that was going to come just like this one. And you guys killed him. You who had the law and disobeyed it. Well, I guarantee you that was grounds for him being killed. And they were willing to commit murder over an argument about the law, the temple, and the land. They committed murder over that. And that's amazing. But it happened. So, Acts 7-1 starts off this way. And I'm just reading you the first phrase. Now, the high priest said, Are these things so? Well, you can know that he meant to subdue Stephen from the very start. Imagine the high priest probably elevated above him and above the whole Sanhedrin and the, he's surrounded by all these fellows in their robes and the high priest is in his high place and he gets up and says, are these things so? And so Stephen, who has been uh, bound, apparently, they laid hands on him and brought him as a prisoner but according to their law, he had to be allowed a defense, and so he gives a defense. Now, I've already told you that there are theologians that say he didn't really give a defense until he got down at the last and told them about how they had murdered the Messiah. That was a defense. Well, there are some that even deny that it was a defense at all. I am going to take the position that from the first word to the last word, this was a defense of Christianity and what Jesus taught, and it had to do with what the church was supposed to say to the Jews. And I also am going to point out to you that we've come through the sixth chapter, and in that area of the scripture, you find that the dispute was between the widows of the Hellenists against those from Judea who wouldn't take care of their widow's right and the apostles were called a hand on it and had to intervene and the apostles recommended that they appoint some men of good character and of good reputation and who had this evidence of the Holy Spirit in their life and they elected them and the church did it. The church elected them to serve and this Stephen is one of the seven. And so we get into the question here of what in the world are uh, those that are called deacons in the church? Is, is this, is what's going on right here what a deacon is? Well, I guarantee you that we don't know much about this the way we do deacons. And I'm not sure how to apply this exactly without getting into something I'll stay out of today. But this is the longest, and I say one of the most important speeches 
in the New Testament, or at least in Acts, Stephen proclaims the gospel to them in ways that no one expected. And I, and I brought up about the apostles that they had to recommend that some men be appointed because they said, well, it's not right for us to be waiting on tables. Well, so they appointed some men that were lesser, lesser importance and lesser prestige and so forth to wait on the tables. Okay. So now we've got one of those lesser men out there proclaiming the gospel and and this is this is not just me talking i think it's it's luke talking luke is telling you that the apostles thought that they were called of god to minister to the jews only and in jerusalem only and they were not going to take the gospel to the diaspora nor to the Gentiles. And Stephen said we are. And this is it. And this is why Stephen got in trouble. And I think as we read Acts, we will find that the apostles never really were run out of Jerusalem until this, until the time that they got into up at Antioch and the, and the Gentiles and the uncircumcised people. And I will tell you, that Stephen is going to refer to circumcision in his speech. And I did a little bit of research about where he was coming from and all these things, and some of that in Genesis in light of this speech is the most interesting study. There's some of the best stories in the Bible about this family in Genesis and how it came to be. Uh, you're going to get into them in your Sunday school study of Genesis um, about... Uh, the brothers that de 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 betrayed their own brother and sold him into slavery and how they wound up four year, 400 years in slavery themselves and so forth. That's an interesting story. Well, I'm not into that one tonight, but I'm telling you that this man knew all about that and he told it to them in a way that they hadn't thought of before. And it's as far, uh, I, I'm going to say that it was out of line with how the apostles were telling it. And it wasn't out of line with how Paul and Barnabas told it later. It's in line with that. But this right here is the cutting edge of the gospel coming to the world rather than just the Jews. Now, I made a statement right then. Y'all got a question about that? So here we go. I see that I've made a mistake on my numbers there. This, uh, this computer outthinks me sometimes on what the numbers are, and it's supposed to be automatic, and it's not. But anyway, Stephen proclaimed the gospel to him in ways that no one expected. It's new what he did. He indicts the Jewish leaders for their failure to appreciate that Jesus was really their Messiah. And he scolds them for not recognizing what salvation he had provided for them. And I want you to watch in Stephen's speech as we go through it, how he talks about how God provided salvation for his people and he did it all over the known world, not just in Palestine. That's one of the keynotes of this speech, is that it started out up yonder in, in Ur of Chaldees, and then it went a thousand miles up there where Turkey is now, and when it, was, it was up there, and then it, all of a sudden it's come down here, and then it's over in Egypt, and God is saving his people out in the desert everywhere, and not just up on that hill where the temple is. And that's where they had really gotten. That's the problem about the temple. So he gets into the three great pillars. And the reason he did is because that's what they charged him with. The Holy Land and the Pentateuch or the Law of Moses and then the temple. And I've got here Habakkuk 2 and 20, one of the scriptures that they would have been able to quote really quick. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. 
And so you can interpret that to say that there's only one place where that is, and that's on that hill up there in Jerusalem. And, um, and I call it the uh, God in the box theory that they had. And that is that they had this hill there at Jerusalem, and they had this temple on that hill that they had built. And they had a box in there that they had built, and God was in that box, and so on and so forth. And, and Christianity is trying to say, hey, guys, you need to rethink who God is. So who is God? Well, <laughs> I had a class one time where I was required to write a paper on who is Jesus Christ. I'm sure glad they didn't ask me who is God and have me write a paper on that. It's, it's both simple and and beyond, who, y'all, y'all ever seen a paper that explained it all? Well, the book, that's what this book is about, and that's what we got, and I don't have to rewrite it, thank the Lord. Stephen points to Jesus as the eternal Savior of Israel and the world, and they said, we don't need another Savior, we've already had all these Saviors. Well, Stephen said, no, you haven't, and that's what's coming here. And so after 70 A.D., and the temple did, did get destroyed, then what was the doctrine that exists today? Well, they had to de-emphasize the land. Now, today they've gone back to it and, and they're emphasizing it again. And they had to de-emphasize the temple. And they had to uh, redefine the religion. And while the temple was there, they emphasized the sacrifices. So what did they do after the temple was destroyed? Well, the priests were out of business. They could not offer sacrifices, and so they met a meeting down at Jomnia, and some of the people that are mentioned in here were down there. And they decided that the book is what they had left, and they would be people of the book, and that's who they are now. But they've started being people of the land again. That's what the war is about. So here we are in Acts 1 now. The high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? You can just almost hear it thundering out upon him. And so in verse 2 it says, To this he replied. Now those that say that this is not a defense, but a history of Israel, <laughs> they didn't read this thing very carefully, I don't think. It's, it is a reply about the charges. I mean, it's what it says. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The glory of God, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Well, Those that tell me that Stephen was a member of the ignorant ignoramuses that hadn't been to their schools, haven't read that right there, that right there is a, is a monument to the orator's art and education. Brothers, well, that's... Uh, None of us are Hebrew scholars or Greek scholars, and I'm not either. But I do put it in there once in a while and try to show you what it means. And he used this phrase, and there a Delphos. Well, if you use a Delphos by itself, it doesn't mean brothers. It means those born of the same mother, and that can be sisters. And so that word, and er, means men that are born of the same mother. And the mother is the children of Abraham, so, or Israel, is their mother. And so, brothers and fathers. Well, the fathers are the members of the Sanhedrin, I, I think. Uh, you can interpret that another way if you like, and it'll be fine. Brothers, that is fellow Hebrews. In other words, they're saying that this is a flatland foreigner from out yonder, probably from Alexandria, Egypt, and he's come up here lecturing us about our religion. He didn't start off that way. He said, fellow Hebrews, fellow sons of Abraham. He claimed he's one of them 
right off the bat. Y'all get that? Listen to me. Well, that's powerful. Uh, it's just one word, a cool. Well, what in the world does it mean? Well, it's got several meanings. The first one is pay attention. I mean, maybe some of our school teachers need to learn that word and teach it to the kids. Pay attention. But it also means to comprehend. Put this in your head and think about it. And Jesus, and I quote Jesus down here, Luke 8, 8, in the parable of the seed, of the sowing of the seed, other seed fell into good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as much. And as he said these things, he would call out, the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, Jesus used that phrase right there. And when, when, he, when Jesus told us to use our ears to hear, he all, this phrase means, if it's a command, to both hear it or to, I'll give it three meanings. To hear it, to comprehend it, and to obey it. And biblically, I will tell you about that word. That if it's a command and you didn't obey it, that means you didn't hear it. And so when he uses that word, a kulo, I mean, he got their attention. He knew how. Does that sound like a sheep herder to y'all? No. So I've got it up there again. To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me, the, the God of glory. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to tell you the significance of that. He didn't just say the God of our fathers or your God or my God. He said the God of glory. What is the God of glory? Well, that's theos doxa in the language. And what does it mean? Well, it's, talk, it's not talking about a halo that the artist put on all these holy people and angels and all like that. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the honor of God, the dignity, the majesty, the worthiness, the praise that's due him. In, uh, in the 28th chapter of Genesis, there's a uh, phrase about God Almighty. Well, what does Almighty mean? It means a God that can do anything. And if he says it, it'll happen. And that's who he's talking about here, the God of glory, that God. Does that sound like a God that they've got in a box? And they're building up on the hill in Jerusalem. Do y'all do y'all see what's happening here? He's gone way beyond that box. The God of glory appeared to our Father, and He didn't say your Father. It's our Father. I'm one with y'all. I'm not somebody else. You fellow Israelites. And He said, Abraham or Abraham. That is the father of all Jews. Well, was he? I'm going to ask that question here. Do you all know that he was their father as much by adoption in some cases as by being their father? Well, it says so, and I'll show you. So I'll ask the question, who was the first Jew? Well, you, you're going to see that. That come up here too. It says while he was still in Mesopotamia. Well, where is Mesopotamia? Well, it's over there in uh, what we call Iraq, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The word Mesopotamia means the land between the rivers, and this is those old rivers. Uh, my son was supposed to send me a picture tonight that I can show you. He was stationed in Iraq, and you could see across the field what was supposed to be Abraham's palace or whatever it was at the Ur of Chaldees, and I'm supposed to be able to show you that picture tonight, but I missed it. But I don't think he likes the Tigris. 
because one of his buddies that he was in the tank, Army tank school with, a Marine by the way, was in a tank that got driven into the Tigris and it turned upside down and it, and it drowned them all. That's sad. And, and the Tigris is related to us in ways that we don't understand. But it was related to them in ways that they did understand. They came from there. That's who they were. It was, but Stephen's point is that God didn't have to be found up there on that hill at that house in that box that Abraham was out there between those rivers in that Gentile land 1,600 walking miles from Jerusalem and, and the God of glory appeared to him out there. Do y'all get the point? I mean, that's pretty subtle, but it's right there. They had to deal with that. And he told him, God told him to leave your land and your people. Well, who was he, who was he taking with him and who was he leaving? Well, are these people that he left Gentiles or are they Jews? Well, that whatever it was, there's separation. And God said, go to a land that I will show you. And this is another land, and this is a land that was promised but not possessed. And, that's, and Stephen is making a point here, and I'll go on and, and uh, bring you up to date on what the point was. And the point is that Abraham never in his life owned one foot of Palestine except what he bought for a graveyard. There was no place that Abraham ever personally inherited that was his to live on. You all get the point? And so I've got God's call of Abraham here in the, in the King James, back in the 12th chapter of Genesis. Now the Lord had said to Abram, or Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And that last phrase right there is what was not happening about this theology of the law, the land, and the temple. God was supposed to bless them, but not all people. And Stephen is the one that's saying that Hey, we're supposed to be blessing all people. Now, I've got this in other versions, and I just want to show you something about what scholarship can do over time. Now, this right here, this translation was made over 400 years ago with the knowledge they had of translation at the time. Now, here is the Christian Standard Bible. Now, that's owned by Holman Bible Publishers. You know who Holman is? Well, that's us. That's Southern Baptist. And so this is our latest version of it. And you see there, I've got a note down there, poetry, based on the phrase, I will. Y'all see that? All right, take a look at this diagram. The Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I'm going to stop here and point out to you that in Hebrew, poetry was not like a rhyme of a little phrase like Jack and Jill went up the hill. That's the way we do it. With them, it was a repetition of ideas. And this version of their poetry is based on the phrase, what God will do. This is that it's a takeoff on the I will, and y'all can see it there, all right? Verse 2, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. That's, the, that's a chorus. And now the rest. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And here's the last of the chorus. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, I'll give you another. 
This is a new American standard, which is a modern, really a modern translation of the King James. And this, uh, this is uh, done by the Lockman Foundation out in California. And it's done by scholars from really all the denominations they could get to join in this. Southern Baptist had something to do with this. So we can't renounce it. And this one is, uh, the poetry is based on the word and. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And... I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All right, now is that not amazing? Well, there it is down at the bottom, and it's a, uh, I'll go on and read the next four verses that I have not been reading. So Abraham went away as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the people which they had acquired in Haran. I'll stop there and ask. Y'all remember I asked who's a Jew? What's this about the people they had acquired? Is that the sons of Abraham and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the people which they had acquired in Haran or Haran you, you hear Iran in there somewhere and they set out for the land of Canaan so they came to the land of Canaan that's the new American standard 2020. 20, 20, I guess so. Acts 7 1 again. Are these charges true? The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still where? In Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. I thought it said that Abraham in Genesis left from Haran when he was 75. Y'all remember that? Well, there's people that have picked this speech apart and said, well, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you an explanation for some of that. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So Stephen is speaking about the Holy Land. And he's talking about Abraham who received God's call out there in these far places. Haran is 600 walking miles north up in Turkey. And Ur is a thousand miles back down the Tigris River to the Persian Gulf. But it wasn't Jerusalem and it wasn't the Holy Land. And so do you all see that, that Stephen is pointing out to these people that your idea that you got God up on that hill and nowhere else is, is not just exactly all there is to it. Genesis 15, 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. Well, you get into the question, well, when did God come to Abraham? Well, I'm not going to get into that tonight. Uh, it's in here. Nehemiah 9 and 7. You are the Lord God. Well, that word Lord also gets into the idea of, of being God Almighty. And you all know what the Lord of hosts means? It's the God of the armies. Why? It, their idea of a Lord is someone who could say a word and everybody in the kingdom, if, if, 
if the king or the Lord said jump, everybody in the kingdom would leave the ground. That's that's a that's a that's a Lord or a king. And this is the Lord God who chose Abraham, who chose Abram, and brought him out from Ur of the Chaldees and named him Abraham, uh, that is father of nations. So God's call to Abraham was heard far, far from Jerusalem. And it was in a Gentile or heathen land. And Terah, who was Terah? Or Terah? Well, that's Abraham's father. And it says that Abraham's father was with them out of Ur and up yonder. So, who got God's call down there at Ur? Was it Terah or Abraham? Well, no, I can't answer that. But that, that's some of the mystery of what's here. And Stephen's pointed it out to them, but they don't know either. At Haran, God told Abraham to leave that place and his relatives. That's what we get out of it. God did not show Abraham where the land that he would possess was. Well, you'd think if they were right about the land and the holiness of the land and the fact that they had to come there to worship and couldn't worship anywhere else, you'd think that that would have come across to him with all this. Y'all get the point here that he's making? I'll go on. There's a picture of Haran. You see the empty country out there? Well, uh, if, as you read about Joseph, you will find that uh, the brothers that went down there to buy grain were, in, were instructed to be sure and, and uh, tell the Egyptians that they were shepherds. And, and that would mean that they were humble and that they were just buying grain. They weren't spies. And Joseph said, y'all are spies. Well, Haran is a place where you couldn't much be much of anything else but a shepherd. But at least if you were big enough and Tyra was big enough, you could be the Lord over a lot of people. And Abraham, when he brought his out of there, he had a group of people. And it had grown. And, and I just read you a scripture that said, that he had acquired them. And I think I can also show you in Genesis where it says to Abraham, bring the people that you have acquired. There's, a, there's the uh, tell at Haran. That's where the village was where they lived apparently. And that's a, that's a picture of the ruins that are there. And you can see that that's not a big city like Nineveh. It's, it's just a local place, but that wasn't big enough for Abraham, so God said, go where I'm going to show you. So Genesis 12, 4. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired. You see, I got that in big letters. They took all those people with them and they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. And Abr Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. What's this about this thing in Jerusalem where there was no other place where they could offer their sacrifices and come to God? And Abraham is a place called Shechem. And by the way, when Jesus met the woman at the well, they, they had a discussion about this. And the woman told, told Jesus that we're supposed to worship right here. And she probably quoted that Abraham built an altar right there. And Jesus said, whoop. That's not the way we're going to worship. The time will come when we worship God. How? Up yonder on that hill or on this hill? He said, we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. You remember the words of Jesus? Stephen is a man that understood that. Abraham built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. 
And from there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. He didn't even stay there. He was a wandering Jew, they call it, or a nomad. And he lived in tents. And I think Stephen would, uh, there's a subtle argument in here that the tabernacle was what God said for them to have and the temple was their idea. David set about to build it and, and God forbade it and he let Solomon build it. And uh, Stephen is trying to say the tabernacle, the point of, the difference between the tabernacle and the temple is that God is with us wherever we are and the tabernacle was with them wherever they were. The temple is not that way. These people are scattered all over the world and they gotta come all the way back to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. Do y'all see what Stephen is saying here? I hope that I'm using this where it makes sense. This is the countryside at Shechem. And you can, uh, this, of course, pictures tell a thousand words, but they can also be made to lie. But you can see that it's a little greener here than it was up yonder at Haran. Uh, that may have to do with the time of the year, but there's pastures there, and the shepherds could make it right there. And um, this is where Jacob's well was between these hills. And this is where Jesus met the woman at the well down there. And uh, this is the ruins of the tell, the town right there. Y'all see? Y'all see that right there? That's the town, Shechem, in the time of Abraham. Acts 7 and 4. And this is Stephen again talking about Abraham. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. Well, you see that after the death of his father? That's one of those things where they've tried to pick this thing apart as him as being ignorant. I'll, I'll show you. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abram had no child. And what Stephen is trying to say to him is that God is a God of promises. He is a God who's with you wherever you are. You don't have to be on that hill and in that building for God to be with you. He's with you wherever you are. And when God has promised you something, that promise is good, and, it, and God will make it good. And Jesus made us some promises, and he's trying to say that the promises that we've got through Jesus are God's promises, and they're good. So the promise that Abraham got at Shechem, he's still a nomad. He had no descendants. He built an altar there, not a temple, just a pile of rocks. Do you mean to tell me that they had that magnificent temple that they had spent so much time and money building it took years and years, it was not even finished in Jesus' time. They were still working on it. Uh, some people say that when they stoned Stephen, they had stones right there handy because they were still building, putting stones in the temple. Well, uh, all that Abram could do is build a pile of rocks and dedicate it to God. And that's the way it is. God's with you wherever you are, whether you're on the water or on the land or in the air or wherever. Abraham's faith and the Lord's promise are what existed then. These other things hadn't come to be. What existed then was the relationship between God and that man. Now, is Christianity like that? Do we have a relationship with God? Is that what really exists? I put 2 Timothy 1.12 down here below this page. For this reason, I also suffer these things talking about the sufferings that Paul suffered just like Stephen. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know 
whom, not what I believe, but whom I have believed and am persuaded that he, I've had a discussion with people that said God was not a he, he was a, a force, a thing, an it. It doesn't say it is able, it says he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. And that's all Abraham had, and Stephen is trying to point out to these guys that that's all they've got. So, Luke investigates the gospel story with the eyewitnesses. And I've gone back now to the first chapter of Luke to call attention to what Luke is doing here and what Stephen is doing here. Luke said, the first thing he said, many have undertaken to draw up an account. Well, if you think that Matthew, Mark, and Luke is all that the church had to read, that would be sadly wrong. What you have gotten is centuries of choices and decisions that have been made by God's people. God's people have the Holy Spirit and can claim the inspiration of God. And the word has come to us through their hands, through the inspiration of God. And so he said, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first, eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And so Luke has interviewed the ones that were there to get the story of what actually happened according to the eyewitnesses. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too, well, y'all would be, I, I, I could just come in this class and show y'all the names of the writings that we have from that time. And it's not just four. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And in this case, we are the Theophilus that can read this and know about the truth of what we've been taught. So, there it is. Fourth verse, so he left the lands of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran after the death of his father. God sent him to this land where you are now living. Well, I have run out of time and so I'm going to finish with this slide. And this will give you a week to forget it because this is the controversy. This one of them. I decided I'm going to show you all just one of these little controversies. Well, Genesis says, after Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram. Nahor, of the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And I just added a verse to give you an idea of the passage of time. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur. So they, uh, they, he lost a son while they're still living in the Ur of Chaldees. In verse uh, 32 of the 11th chapter, Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. All right. Genesis 12, the next chapter, verse 34, says, So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years when he set out from Haran. Now, have you all ever tried to do the math of these things? Well, I'm going to do it for you, then I'm going to tell you this. Forget it. it. It's not that there's a reason that these things happen. And I'll try to explain it briefly. It, it can't be done briefly, but I'll, do, I'll try. But it says here that Terah was 70 years old when Abraham was born and Abraham was 75 when he left Haran and Stephen says that uh, 
You see up there in Acts 4, after the death of his father, Terah died before Abraham left, according to that. And down below it says Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran. And that means that uh, Terah was 70 years old plus 75, which is 145. So what's this about 205? Well, I'll explain it this way. And that is that over time, people tell stories different ways. And they take on different versions of how a story gets told. Now, there's a thing called the Septuagint that was translated down in Egypt into Greek. And before the time of Jesus, the Jews had not even settled on the version that we have of the Old Testament. And so there's these different ideas among the Jews about time and so forth. And you may even get into a, a thing here about how in, in this place they calculate a man's age by a system. And over here at this place they calculate it by another system. And you'll get two different ages. I don't know how this worked out. But I know that I'm not worried about the truth of God's word. Even though you can point to that right there and say, oh, the Bible's full of lies. Well, it's not. What it's full of sometimes is men's evidence of men's opinion and their version of how it happened. All I'm going to tell you is that that thing is there and you can pick Stephen's speech apart in other places and say, oh, he didn't know what he was talking about. Well, he did, too. And so we have completed the assigned time for this day. Do you have questions that you, <laughs> that you dare to ask? You, you're asking me something that's my opinion. And I say that what a Jew is, is someone who has received the call of God and God's promise to Abraham. And if it applies to the sons of Abraham by blood, then they're Jews and Abraham was the first Jew. If it applies, and, I, and I, I was in a class with Rabbi John Pelley at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he was asked, with me sitting there listening, who is a Jew? And he gave three definitions, and one Jew, one, one of the definitions is, is one that I'll, always, I'll remember them all, but I can remember this one the best. He said, he who says he is a Jew is a Jew. If you'll get to thinking about it, who is a Christian? Well, of course, if you can't confess Jesus by saying you're a Christian, then uh, you're not one. Now, that doesn't say that if people, there are people who claim they're Christians that, that don't believe. But the point is that if you say you're a Jew, they admit that you're a Jew. You don't have to have the blood. And that's the way it is with the Muslims. You know how you get to be a Muslim? You say two words. I submit. And in Christianity, it's more complicated than that, but basically you say, I believe. When I was in the Holy Land, I was instructed to never say that I'm a Christian because there's people who kill you for that. But you can say you're a believer and they respect it. Are there other questions? Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray that you will give us a right understanding of your word. Teach us how to serve you better. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.